Good afternoon, everyone, in the House Bill 3610 Task Force on Alcohol Pricing and Addiction Services in Order. Hey, can we get a, um, a roll call there? Senator Solman. Excuse. Senator Cano. Don't see him in there yet. Rep. Sanchez. Present. Representative Warner Rushke. Present by video. Doug Barrett. Present by video. Vaughn Barry. Oh, she's going to be late. Rob Corbett. Oh, okay. I see you. Annalise Dolph. Oh, excuse me. That's right. She's not here today either. Sorry. Jamie Floyd. Got in time for roll call. Let's see, Jamie. Dr. Tom Jean. Present. Todd Jeter. Present. John Colmer. Here. Sarah Lochner. Sarah also out today. Yeah. Jana McCamey. Present. Director Prince. Present. Marcus Reed. Jason Renault. Danelle Romain. Here. Solaris Salazar. Here. Aaron Sornoff Wood. Here. Form is present. Thank you. Well, folks, uh, so a little bit of a, a schedule shift. Uh, we did have AOC originally on our list today, but that didn't get communicated as well as we had hoped, and or, you know, stuff happens. So we're not going to be presenting today. We'll uh, reschedule that uh, once further down the road here, but I just want to identify, though, that, and then for future, the next meeting that we have scheduled is May 2nd. Reminder, folks, that that is going to be here in the morning, not in the afternoon. That is scheduled for 10 a.m. to noon on May 2nd, same location. I want to be really clear about that. That will be the, the presentation from the wine uh, folks, wine industry, uh, with a presentation to include uh, a national autonomous shape. Um, <clears throat> we have beer, wine, and spirit. Oh, I'm sorry, beer, wine, and cider. Presenting plus that a kindness. Okay, that's okay. Okay, and then the second one will be more on the laws and okay, legislative solution. I did it down a little bit differently, but that's fine. Perfect. I'll just send something to you and Rosie to let you so much. Yes, I really, really do appreciate it. We can just so that we can get the information out, people are really aware of what's going on and what people find to do with. And then, um, we had talked about. Counties and CCOs. The question came up at one point about CCOs and having that percent. We are going to we're working on that piece as well, and and maybe seeing if we can have that that meeting together for as long as we need to. And then um, we're also uh, we don't we don't have anything scheduled on the 27th of June. So we as we're adding then the AOC and others, we might be pushing things back a little bit to get OLC maybe on the 27th of June instead. We just keep kicking it back a little bit there and there, which is. You know, it's not the worst thing in the world, right? More, more prepared, right? I hope that works. We also didn't have anything on the schedule for um, for the month of July. And while I don't necessarily feel like we have to have anything in the month of July, I kind of feel like we might want to put something on the schedule just so that we have more time to actually have conversation, if that's at all possible with folks. So I wanted to just propose that, that we... Uh, see if there is a date in July that most people can work with. 
So I don't have my calendar, but it's a great second, but I will. Is there is there an absolute no way Jose in July that people have? First week is pretty rough with the board and whatnot. Right. Mm -hmm. And sure, maybe you know. There is the. Oh, I, I, CSG West is happening um, in July, so I just wanted to warn you about that for some of the legislators. Right, that Thursday, the 11th. Yeah. Oh, Jason is here. Oh, there you are. Jason is here. Um, yeah, so July, July 11th, you're right. Uh, it is in the first week. Second week is Thursday, July 18th. Folks on, on video, July 18th, is that an option? And again, it's not a solid anything. It's just an option that we might have to put uh, put together just in case we, we need a little bit more time to have conversation. Because, you know, as we're going through this, we're looking at lots of different things and having lots of conversation. And, you know, we at one point I thought, well, we didn't need all this much time, you know, and uh, clearly that's not a thing. Uh, and we need a little bit more time than what I originally anticipated. So I want to make sure that we have the opportunity. So if we can set aside July 18th as an option, an optional uh, moment, if people will put that on their calendars, we will send that out again for folks. Uh, I know, uh, did the entire thing get set yet? Uh, sent out as calendar invites, full calendar invites? Oh, yeah. I believe we're going to send that out after this meeting okay. to make sure everyone has the right. invite, right? Right, because yeah. what I don't want is for, is in particular, obviously, legislators tend to get way too many things on their schedule, and um, it gets overrun if we don't get it ahead of time or have it on the list. So, okay, so I'm gonna I'm gonna set that one in place. Ask uh, uh, Ruby Adam just send that out along with everything else to assure that we have July 18th as a day that we're gonna hold. Yes, and we we have a commission meeting in this room, and so if we do it in the afternoon like this, it will be oh really yeah perfect. Absolutely, that is the best time for me as well. Okay, thank you. Okay, that being said, let me see if I have anything. Okay, so as I said, let me push that one back. Um. All right. Don't. Oh, right, right, right. Well, yeah. Um. So, so in part, Sharon was sure that um questions came in. J O H A came in to us at O L C C and to Rex. Oh, right. That's what it's. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. If folks um because a lot because. Communication is huge, right? Making sure that everybody is all on the same page. I would truly appreciate it. That's not what I was going to say. I wanted to talk more about that. These probably CPOs. Yeah, yeah. But what I really want to make happen is that we're all communicating and on the same page. So if you have information or questions that you want to ask, sending it to the entire group is really, really hugely important because I will tell you, when I used to teach, one of the things I would often say to, to students is, it, not, there's not a, it's not a dumb question if the other person sitting next to you still has the same question and they don't get an answer either because you didn't want to say anything. I want everyone to be on the same page. I want some transparency and some communication to happen really, really well amongst folks. So if we could possibly just ask everybody the question, if there's a question, communicate with with the whole group because unless I mean I can't imagine that there's anything that we want to keep totally secret but I want people to be feel like we're communicating hopefully everybody will work well together we have to we have to come up with something eventually but I want people to communicate with the entirety so it, so things don't get lost and um, and and uh, and then we can get all their questions answered right and, okay. and, and Folks had a question about CCOs, and they are actually sitting on the, um, the yeah. task force. Yeah. So these questions can be asked directly to them, or we can put yeah. a presentation yes. um, from CCOs. Which mm -hmm. that is, I hope, the plan too. Yes. yes. To yeah. put together that presentation. And maybe hospitals in the state as well. Okay. If people have questions at the hospital. 
Yes, sir. The only trick to that, um, Madam Chair, is the public meeting, uh, public meeting issue. Okay. So if you do put something out, we can't then have a dialogue about it in the emails, I don't think. I don't okay. have DOJ here, but we'll, we'll get clear on that. I, I just don't want us to run afoul of any public meeting laws. No, of course not. The whole quorum on a dialogue. Well, it's, it's not a dialogue. That's the thing. I don't want a dialogue via email. I want a dialogue. I want questions. Okay. If it's a question of the entire group, if that's the important thing, not that we're responding to it. My hope is that we will respond here okay. in the public meeting rather than online. I will, I really want to make sure that we're having, but if there is a question to be asked, it should be asked of everybody so that, you know, somebody else may be cued to say, yes, that's the one I want to know and whatever those things are. Thank it you. really is just about open communication in terms of information that everybody might need. Sure. Yeah, definitely. Thank you for that clarification though, on that piece. That's really important for people to recognize as well, that we don't want to have back and forth communication like that. I think that was actually part of it. We were hoping to avoid. Correct. Uh, so, okay. Thank you. Anything else? Any other questions, thoughts, reviewing uh, the uh, uh, work plan? Yes, Aaron. Um, Again, I don't know if now is the time to address it, but the question I was looking for was related to network adequacy. And I was hoping for some clarity. I had understood that uh, Oregon law requires that insurance providers provide adequate services uh, or adequate access to uh, care providers. And for OHP specifically, I was wondering, uh, it's also mentioned that Oregon Health Authority is tasked with monitoring and enforcing that adequacy. And I was hopeful that. Uh, we understand what processes or methods were being used to track that adequacy to make sure that it is being that, that it's being met. And if not, you know, how do we determine that and if any action has been taken to address that? Uh, yes, yeah, so this is Tom from the um, I think that's really a question for the kind of service side of OHA. So um, maybe if you could formulate that question over email, I can work with them to get a response to the next meeting. Perfect. I'll make sure we have a complete response. So, yeah. And uh, thank you, Dr. Tom Jean, for saying your name and <laughs> comments. That's so very helpful because I forgot about it too. <laughs> okay, uh, again, are we good at the moment? Thank you so much, everyone. So I wanna move us forward then with the local government perspective. And uh, we can take it from Scott Nichols and Lindsay. Uh, and okay. is online. She's at a that conference is. in Edelman, I believe. So uh, she will chime in and help me with okay. Okay. maps. Um, One moment, I just got to load it up real quick. Okay, good to go. Uh, thank you for having me. I'm Scott Winkles. I'm a public safety lobbyist, among other things, a public safety and health lobbyist for the League of Oregon Cities. I've been in that position for about 18 years now. Um, and this is an issue that we've seen come up uh, periodically in that, in that last couple of decades or so, uh, where uh, people have recognized that our our uh, beer and wine cider, and now, now uh, hard seltzer uh, taxes do tend far lower than the rest of the country. And we do believe it has an impact on service levels for Oregon's cities in particular. Um, I usually give a pretty direct presentation, so I'm going to give you the conclusions up front. Um, we do have, we can track alcohol, uh, that alcohol consumption does have a cost, a significant cost to cities. We really don't have a way to recruit that cost. And we do know that the uh, liquor contributes vastly more revenue to local governments than the other uh, uh, types. Um, going into this, so most of the city costs related to alcohol consumption are related to police. And we have some, some stats up here and some figures, and I, these were derived from some interviews that we did, some of them go back to 2011 and as a report we published back then, but also we verified these uh, to ensure they're current. 
So one DUI fatality or serious injury by uh, investigation is going to take about 40 hours of police time. That's just the investigative time. And it doesn't even get, really doesn't even get to the end of the court uh, time. And that can be, which can be expensive. On top of those investigations, the cost we experience having to certify the experts who uh, are responsible for those investigations, uh, track uh, traffic crash reconstruction experts, drug recognition experts. Now we're getting into uh, drone pilots to take uh, the, over, the, the overflight views of the crime scene. These are these are not cheap. These are not. Uh, takes a tremendous amount of time to get an officer to the point where they can actually tell you from the debris on the road how that traffic crash occurred and what substances were involved with in, in the parties. Uh, in, in, you know, we're seeing about 167 uh, traffic fatalities, we saw 167 traffic fatalities in 2019 related to DUIs. Keep in mind about two thirds, we would expect two thirds of those fatalities to occur in cities or have city involved investigations. We make up about, we make up about 70% of the police officers in the state of Oregon. Most of those, most officers in the state are employed by uh, our cities. Looking at some more, you know, run of the mill mundane investigations, one DUI investigation, that's going to take about four to eight hours of police time, depending on the circumstances. If it's, if it's your standard DUI where Officer sees erratic driving, they pull over, the person cops do it, they or there's obvious evidence. Um, that's a, that's about a four hour investigation, about one and a half hours uh, to process uh, the go through the intoxilizer interview, report writing, plus you need another officer to sit on the tow. Um, if you start looking into something more complicated where the person's fighting it, you're looking at DUI here or uh, DMV hearings on the license, court hearings. There are some very good criminal defense attorneys who uh, Craig knows this from his last gig. So well, this is his area of criminal defense. This is Craig. Yes, yeah, so there are some very good defense attorneys who, who who specialize in DUI defense, and so that does take a great deal of effort on and skill on the part of our officers to, to make sure that those people who have committed that offense do, do pay some accountability for it. Um, the part that's harder to quantify that we know exists is that alcohol tends to act as an incident multiplier to any other sort of police call. So two sober people trying to resolve a noise complaint probably isn't going to involve the police. Two drunk people trying to resolve a noise, a, a noise complaint you have a much higher likelihood. Uh, then you're looking at having to find a place to, you know, to to take those people, even if it's not a criminal offense. We don't have enough sobering facilities in Oregon, so uh, trying to ensure that a person who maybe doesn't have a charge but is in a position where they're not able to take care of themselves is going to be safe. That's that's a very time-consuming uh, obligation. Additionally, you're looking at things like discon, disorderly conduct, trespass. Simple assaults, you know, there aren't a lot of human uh, human conflicts that are made better by intoxication, um, and that is when uh, Oregon's police officers uh, have to engage. And keep in mind, and the thing that I think we find frustrating as cities is that when our officers have to engage in this uh, and protect the public from this sort of conduct, it's because something upstream didn't work. It's the prevention message didn't take. They did not rethink the drink. Uh, they were overserved. Um, there's we have a, there's a density issue. There's um, we were unable to regulate uh, to to address it. And we are doing this with one of the lowest poli uh, police per thousand numbers in the country. We have one. We employ this is according to the FBI. Uh, we employ about 1.5 full-time police officers per thousand residents, and that puts us either at the bottom or definitely in the bottom five uh, for policing in in in, in, this, in the country. Sir, just a very, just a very quick clarifying question, Tom G. No H A. Um, on your first bullet point, and maybe you said this and I missed it. Uh, you say city costs related to abuse are primary to alcohol related. Is that referring to substance use or physical abuse? Sorry, alcohol abuse. I think we have a typo in there. 
Yeah. So, but is it bring this? So, most substance abuse city costs are related to alcohol. Is that correct? Mm, I, I don't know that we're ready to say that, but we can't. We do know alcohol, uh, alcohol plays a primary. Uh, it, it may be true for all of these. Yeah. It, it may be um, more people drink than use other substances, although that some of those substances do jump result in some significant law enforcement activity. But I do want to uh, point you out to the to the graph we use on the slide. Um, when we look at morbidity and mortality, 39% of those of the fatalities related to alcohol in Oregon are, are acute, meaning they're a result of injuries, poisoning, motor vehicle crash, some reason, something happened to that person while they were inebriated and they, it was not consistent with continued human life. The, all of those are going to involve police, involve police investigation at some point. You have to investigate to ensure that no crime was committed, or if there was a crime, how make sure our district, the district attorneys and relevant agencies know know what happened to that individual. Um, and it is uh, it's a very significant ob obligation on our part uh, to protect uh, in our world to protect the public. So. Just appreciating the question, but you want to get through your presentation first. Oh, I'm happy to take questions. questions. Okay, I think Jason has a question on why first, and then I'll get to you. Oh, thanks. Uh, thanks for the presentation. Is there a way of determining what the actual cost of alcohol is to cities? Is there a method or metric of doing that? We did it a very, very long time in 2011. It's a very involved process. We have not been in a position to hire the, the consultant. Um, and the reason we haven't done that, I'll, I actually have a slide about that study, so maybe I could address that then. Okay. Okay. Go ahead. Do you mind? Okay. I just, um, I think. This is the question. I'm sorry to now remain put up here on Twitter. Yeah, yeah, reminder uh, the folks online can't hear. Yeah. Sorry, yes, yeah. yes. Um here is my ignorant question about um DUIs. DUIs are all kinds of substances, not just alcohol. So um, what percentage of DUIs? Yeah, I'm just curious, like what do DUIs look like these days in terms of substances um that people are using? Um, and then my second question is. There's a lot in terms of prevention of DUI that can happen legislatively, and I know we've worked on this in the past. Um, have the cities ever advocated for things like um, um, mandatory ignition interlock devices or all the things that other states are doing to prevent the DUI from happening in the first place? We, I don't know the number, the current numbers on how it breaks down, and then one of the issues with marijuana is. Is, the, is a more common substance that we would encounter. Um, and that's a very difficult case to prove because there's no test, there's no field sobriety test that can tell us if um, the person is high off of mm -hmm. marijuana and, the, and blood tests don't tell us if they're currently intoxicated because of the way it's, it, it's that self The We have engaged in uh, in my time at building, we certainly have engaged in advocacy uh, DUI prevention and ensuring that we have all of these place, that particularly around the repeat offenders and making sure that we're addressing things um, with discouraging behavior. Um, we also have cities that individually engage in campaigns to let people know that they're going to be saturation patrols, um, activities around uh, around large holidays where for events where we expect and Super Bowl Sunday is your is your is your big DUI day. Um, so we do we do certainly engage that in those activities. Um, but, you know, breaking that breaking it down on the marijuana. I don't know that anybody can really tell you what this brand is right now. That was my question. Oh, okay. Yeah. 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 Aaron Sarno, Two Town Cyber. One click uh, clarification that uh, just you mentioned wine taxes were low, and I wanted to note that they are 
clean actors in the US, I think they're 28th and highest in the US. So they're they're not low for a go. Yep. Does that factor in Kanji or does that factor in the fact that Oregon is my sales tax? Uh Aaron Sarno, no, because we have other taxes, but that doesn't factor in like cap tax as well. Um, I'm just looking at our all the taxes you can manipulate lots of things to adjust it. But now we're talking about purely local tax. Uh, one of the challenges we also face is that we really have very few means of mitigating our alcohol related costs. And so um, we have, I have pulled a sampling of the statutes that preempt our ability to regulate or to, to recoup costs on the slide. Um, we, can't in, we can't impose any local fines related to alcohol consumption. The only thing we're really allowed to do is prohibit open care, open the or consumption or possession in certain areas. So like you could have an ordinance in a park, but you're not allowed to say there's no, there's a, we couldn't impose an, an offense for public drunkenness. Um, uh, there is some TPM ordinance, of time, place, manner ordinances we could engage in, uh, and some cities do. Uh, the other issue we have is that we're not able to, re to revoke the license of a, of a, of a provider. And so, for instance, the standard that the OLCC is historical is that's in the statute is a they can they'll take action on a serious or or sorry serious and persistent series of violations. Now, I will use a historical example because I will note that the current OLCC does appear to be more public health and safety oriented than previous uh, administrations. But we had an incident at a bar in Medford, 137 police cars falls over the course of the year that did not apparently meet the serious and persistent standard um, that we had very much wished this closed down. Uh, we will note that there is a, it took the agency quite a while to act on a, uh, an adult venue with a liquor license where uh, some uh, very egregious crimes were being committed uh, to, to eventually pull those, pull that as an institution down. Um, that one was very concerning to us because, again, that is a scenario that alcohol does not add value to um, if you have that sort of conduct going on. Um, and the state reserves the exclusive right to tax liquor and all alcohol. We are completely preempted uh, from imposing any sort of uh, local point of sales tax. I will note that we do have cities that have a uh, food and beverage tax that they are not allowed to tax alcohol now uh, it's uh, Cannon Beach, Ashland, there are a few others um, that will tax the meal, but they're not able to tax the, the, the place, uh, place that tax on the beverage. Um, neither of those jurisdictions appear to be suffering in terms of tourism dollars based on their TLT revenues, transient lodging and tax revenues. Excuse me, sorry. Yeah. I just have a question about, um, I thought there was some interaction between the OLCC and cities on new liquor licenses. Um, what is that? Um, just in terms of density and... Yeah, the, the local... Craig uh, Prince from OLCC. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, there is an interaction on the local government to look at the local impacts. Um, and I'm I'm butchering the name of that. Hopefully, one of my people will text me the correct name. <laughs> we do um, do a local impact statement, basically from the city. And then um, what we do now, and I, you know, like like Scott said, I think we have a focus on on this with compliance and with Rich Evans. Um, we get we we monitor the DYIs, so the officers will tell us. If a name comes up in the report, if it says Craig's Bar, they'll notify us. And so we can be more proactive. And that is it. And I, I will say, and, and, and diverge from my slides, for the, say that is a sea change from previous administrations because we had asked for that in 2009. And we're told that that was not something we could do. And then I bash my head into a hard surface to make it stop hurting. <laughs> uh, uh, it, it's, it's a very much, again, I do think the agency has is, is turned a corner on its obligations to public safety and health. And I, we appreciate that. Um, sorry. 
Aaron Sanoff, Two Township. One more clarifying question. You said that a prohibition on local governments imposing, you know, like open container or the public drunkenness laws. Is there not a state regulation that covers that? What? No. So you can be drunk in public because I've seen people get arrested for it pretty regularly. No, you didn't. What you probably saw was an arrest for, it was either A, an arrest for discon, disorderly conduct, or it was a civil hold where the person was going to go to uh, a sobering facility should one occur. Being inebriated in public is not a defense in the state of Oregon. Thank you. Um, uh, it is a uh, it is treated as a public health issue, and we do have the authority to to uh, temporarily suspend that person's uh, civil rights while they're unable to care for themselves. And then the facility actually the officer just takes them into custody of the facility when they can no longer don't be there. Um, so, 1002 just extended that to 72 members. It did, and thank you so much. That was one of our main asks. So, uh, so here's the consumption chart in Oregon, and I believe you've seen this slide. This is from we we uh, uh, totally ripped this off from OHA, uh, <laughs> and we appreciate it. Uh, this is the consumption by type, and so you'll see uh, the blue line is spirits. Uh, third from the top, uh, and people are consuming about one, one per, per capita, one gallon of pure ethanol from uh, liquor, hard spirits, things that are distributed through through beer, the OCC. Um, it's about identical to beer, about 1.1 gallons per ethanol for beer, and then uh, wine is 0 0.07. Um, actually, we think. We think this these numbers might just be a tad bit off, and uh, because one of the things we have noted, we have a slide from one of the study uh, from an academic journal uh, that and I'll just switch to now. Um, some researchers found that morbidity and mortality mortality had increased, but per capita consumption had not. And so the conclusion that they reached through their analysis was that the uh, the ABV, the, the potent vehicle beverage, had increased over time. I believe the national monitoring study studies done out of National Institute of Health are using a, are presuming an average ABV of four point five percent for beer, um, which I will note just as a as a, as a as a consumer that seems. Low to me now. I, uh, I don't know. It, it doesn't appear just anecdotally. The ABPs are going up. I think we do have some. There are some studies that suggest it, and so uh, I think people are consuming more of the other types of alcohol than than we currently believe. And the amount of money that those types are are contributing to public services is very very different. Uh, the large purple. The 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 uh, closed mouth Pac-Man of this purple Pac-Man of this slide is liquor. The, all the others, and that's 198 million dollars, which is what the governor is assumed, which the OLCC informed the governor she can expect from liquor sales going into the 23-25 biennium, and they she can expect uh, 4.14 million for all other alcohol types despite liquor appearing to be a, uh, consumed less frequently, it's likely than other types. The cost to us, <laughs> whether somebody becomes inebriated and becomes a public safety issue is identical, whether they did it on liquor or beer or wine or hard seltzer, which I have yet to try. Um, don't see the traction, to be honest. <laughs> um, the, uh, that's that. That is the rub of our concern: is that we have we have a cost, and we have one part of this industry, one type of, of beverage that appears to be covering paying for our costs with the others not, and we don't know what else, how else to squeeze money out of. The OLCC. We cities get no money from the bottle from the bottle surcharge. 
um, we simply get the shared revenue that is in the statute. Uh, the other privilege taxes, it it amounts the share of revenue from that amounts to budget uh, for us, but the costs for them we do not. <laughs> I can't speak. This is Danelle from the Mayor of Mr. Beers. I, I respect everything you do, and you've been very consistent for the 18 years you've been doing this. I do respect. I think you have a lot of good things to say here. This is not an apples to apples comparison. The state is in this spirits business. You got a totally different system with beer, wine, and cider. I totally disagree with your consumption um, assertions or whatever um, before that. And the OLCC data essentially says people are buying more spirits and less beer and less wine and less cider. So. That's absolutely different than what's been happening over the last couple of years. And I do wonder why cities haven't gone to lobby for more than uh, less than 3% of money that's going to any addiction services now from all this money that's raised from alcohol. I mean, we're not, a, we're not an addiction provider. We don't provide that service. We provide what we do is protect the public when those things don't happen. But you're part of the formula. So why not ask for more money from the formula instead of asking for just the tax to increase? There's so much money in the system. Why not ask for more of it? We have. Um, we were one of the principal in in interests that asked for the OLCC to increase the, the floor pricing uh, for those products, and that brought in an additional $5 million uh, for us. Where cities are, we actually get more than the county on this. We have two, there are two distribution formulas within that, within that statute. We're, um, and for us to go after after liquor, when the consumption is, if you well, if you can show me where the consumptions, where OHA's consumption slides are off, yeah, I can I can correct. I will I will I will correct. But our take right now, based on the data that we're looking from the state agencies, is that the consumption is uh, is similar, is at least similar, if not higher for the other types. Um, and our costs are the same regardless of where it comes from. The DUI from liquor and a DUI from beer doesn't change. That's not important. That doesn't change how much you're spending. Um, um, Aaron, two towns cider. Do you have any statistics based on those alcohol DUI stops? What type of alcohol they were consuming? Again, it's much easier to become intoxicated on spirits than it is beer or wine, and presumably would be involved in a higher percentage of those traffic stops than the other. We, I can, I can, we can provide you the issue. You know, it's, it's incomplete because the, the way it's determined is you know, the officer interviews, interviews the defendants for the, the, the person under arrest, and they'll tell us what, and they'll tell the officers under the truth. They don't tell the truth often. Um, they don't want to tell, they don't want to get the bar in trouble, they don't want to get their buddies in trouble. They're also inebriated and they don't get their choices. So um, it's a rough, it's a rough, I don't think anybody thinks this is a hard and fast statistic uh, because people don't, they either aren't going to comply or they're not going to be completely honest. I can tell you in, in my time, my brief and non illustrious career in law enforcement, I don't think I ever did conduct such an interview. Where I felt the person actually go into the entire picture of what they were consuming. Um, and, and can I just say, from an addiction person's, we 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 don't get that either. <laughs> they don't tell us to do. Can I just? Uh, Fawn Berry has a comment. Online. Thanks. Um, hi, Scott. Thanks for being here. Um, just a couple of questions about. Um, the funding formula, do you have a slide that maybe walks through how um, that money is distributed? And then I'm curious if there are any stats about kind of the percentage of a city's revenue that is derived from um, alcohol taxes um, or kind of the money coming from OLCC. And then I was also wondering if there has been any discussion or if there are any um, ways to make sure that people who are, um, you know, they're engaged in a crime because of alcohol, is there any point at which you connect them with services or make that connection through one of the, you know, local partners or that sort of thing? Or is, and is there 
um, an opportunity to try to drive people towards treatment by um, by doing something like that. Um, you might have to remind me about all of your questions because I'm going to go as <laughs> best I can. Um, the our, the role of a police officer in a DUI or another alcohol related offense is to determine if the crime was committed. Uh, the corrective action, whether that whether that person needs treatment is going to be a community corrections and a conversation uh, with a with the judge. Um, the, the phrase that I think is, is used is uh, for people getting into treatment under those circumstances is a judge from the judge. Um, that is not. It is practice for an officer to uh, provide information to a person who uh, or common practice who they encounter uh, who has an alcohol problem to attempt to make some sort of a connection to those services. Uh, we don't provide those services. That that's usually a county function, but we can give them referrals. Um, I think that happens pretty frequently. Uh, a lot of times where it does, where it occurs is crime victims. And so if you have, uh, particularly in an area of domestic violence where you have, the victim has, may, may have a substance abuse issue, the officer, go in, they go to these houses pretty regularly and they, they have the addresses memorized. Um, they're going to try to do everything they can to connect that person, to get that person out of there and, and into a safer environment. So uh, it's it's very complicated. You know, the 4002 was actually the first time we uh, passed a statute, that's the mineral intent reform bill that we've uh, actually designed in a criminal statute. We've designed it in such a way as that we connect the person with services in the language. So this is, we're kind of breaking some new ground on that one. Uh, we do have the numbers for how each city gets their, it's a per capita distribution. Um, it's, uh, I can forward you, it's on the OLCC, uh, OLCC page. They're very proud about telling us how much money they give us, and they do a good job communicating on it as well. Um, and we have a shared revenue report when we can, we can, I'm happy to forward. Uh, the statute, the formula set out in statute, we get a, uh, there's, a, there's two, di two different formulas. Uh, we get 12% off of one and 20 on the other. Um, it's our share of revenue tends liquor. It's it's typically it's the city's second largest share of um, income next to property taxes right now. Uh, but it's a it's each Oregonian is assigned a number. How much money we get per per? Uh, oh, that's helpful. I just, I was just curious too if there's any uh, kind of. Um, kind of average that a city has in terms of a budget and what percentage of that might come from those taxes, but we can talk, we can touch base on that later. No, it's not really a good way to compete to, for the average because each city has their own permanent rate and property tax value. So it's, we can just tell you what each resident and each resident would, they're going to receive based on their population. Uh, Craig Prins, OLCC, just one thing, this was our beginning of the biennium revenue estimate, and in February we we uh, brought it down 20% because the um, the estimate was based upon the drinking patterns during COVID, where everyone was home, everyone had money from uh, you know some support with emergency funds, and so you probably all know during COVID that from 20 to 22, I want to say went up 20 percent. So this has been this revenue estimate. We we reduced it in February. Um, I want to say it's a 20 percent reduction to 1.7 billion um, for the distilled spirits. And so and we were just talking about it at the, at the commission. And then um, and we are proud of, of the money we get to to the cities and we'll have um, Tyler or one of the other folks will present the detail of how the distribution works. I know Mazen's on too, I believe, obviously, between Department of Revenue and us. And then I think it was Fawn, just a, was it Fawn who asked the question about the access to services? Wanted to yes. 
wanted to re remind a DUI is eligible for diversion if you it's your first in 10 years what the right venue? and there's no there's no uh, injury to a victim and so in that diversion eligibility you have to complete a drug and alcohol assessment so that's hopefully where we get early intervention would be um, that first DUI you get a diversion opportunity if you haven't hurt someone you get an assessment and thankfully for I don't have the statistics I'm sure we could get them from CJC most people respond to that diversion unfortunately uh, some don't and you get into the more serious consequences. I couldn't find this current stats on it, but my recollection has been that most of your fatalities are, it's not their first DUI, uh, those collisions, but someone who has been uh, resistant to, <coughs> to, to treatment. Um, back in 2011, we conducted a fairly detailed report, which I uh, included a link to uh, that outlined all of our costs related to alcohol. This wasn't, this was actually done defensively as the legislature at the time was looking at changing the shared revenue formula for um, uh, uh, for cities. And that is a, that is a, that's a fight on site issue for us. Um, and so we spent a great deal of time, money and effort to conduct a study along with the counties. We haven't updated the study for a couple of reasons. One is uh, we haven't seen a need to because nothing's really changed. The status of the static mm -hmm. law hasn't really altered too much since then. The patterns still exist. Um, it's just the only real change that we've seen in that time is, is, is population. There's some ebbs and flows and, and as the market shifts. And there are times when, when beer does, is people drink differently. Um, but it's, uh, you know, to, to, to Daniela, to, to your point earlier, it's we've, we found ourselves having to defend our revenue more often than, and been in a position to advocate for increases. And we understand that several parties, that several times people have talked about the increases, increasing the revenues. Um, none of the proposals that I recollect really got at our issue. So, uh, it's been, centered around other units of government and not yet are where we have the concern where it doesn't address our costs. I think our the principal our, our organization is a principal stand as opposed to the preemption. So where we would like to see this go is to lift the preemption and allow us to chart our own course on these issues. And, you know, my members aren't teetotalers by and large. They have done great things to promote their downtown, which includes vibrant nightlifes, ensuring that we have you know, responsible quality establishments where people can enjoy themselves. Uh, but we also have to recognize there's a cost uh, to this. And right now, I think historically, and we have seen no reason to change this perspective, the legislature views with alcohol consumption as revenue, we view it as an expense. That's where we're at. Scott, yes, but sure. Uh, Sean Palmer, hospital Association. So I think it's just kind of been running with your question here, at least a little bit around the CCOs, you know, a little bit of LCC and others. So the revenue that comes from this goes to you guys, is it? Dedicated to something in particular, or cities get it and spend it how they want. Or there's not a restriction. There's not a restriction on it, and that's true of the state. Okay. But the reality yeah, is, yeah. is that that's public safety is our is our that's our largest expense. Yeah, yeah. You know, we have plenty of members who are spending well in excess of their total property tax receipts sure. on public safety. Yeah. So okay. I'm make sure I'm understanding the yeah. the four to eight number that was up here and how you. How your folks are using the revenue resources that they have to get to that number, whether this is actually even covering their costs or not. Yeah, we, I mean, the answer to that's probably no. It was a, it was a hard no, very clear no in 2011, and frankly, nothing's changed since then. Okay. So, yeah. That's what I got. Okay, thank you so much. I appreciate that. Um, 
I didn't hear anything from Lindsay at all. So. Yep. And sure, thank you. Um, yeah, you must have done a good job because Lindsay didn't interrupt you from Wenatchee. So that at least you didn't get away. Okay, can't away. Um, I just I'm always <clears throat> that that high graph of alcohol related fatalities. Tom, is that that same breakdown of you know Scott had it as chronic and acute. And is that the same as that one you present where it's um I always forget the name of it. It's um the other more related to it. Yes. Is that this is what? yeah, I think it's the same source. The pie graph yeah. that you was showing was simply showing the, the difference between the acute and the chronic. Okay. Um, but all of those different um, diseases and injuries and conditions that are talking about all either in whole or in part are presented in that pie chart. Thank you. Okay. Great. Well, thank you so much. Uh, I really appreciate that. We're actually just a little bit behind, not terribly much. Oh, sorry. You. No, no, no worries. It's a lot of really good uh, and important questions. Now we have Julie and is Caroline Cruz online? Perfect. Uh, this is the Oregon Federally Recognized Tribes. Julie Johnson, please feel free to introduce yourself and kind of what you do. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. How, uh, you know, I introduced myself as a Pike woman and mother. Uh, my name is Julie Johnson. I'm the Travel Affairs Director for the Oregon Health Authority. And I really just want to thank you all for the invitation um, to have this convention with you all. It's a very um, important topic for all of us. I know we're all coming to the table with our own priorities and interests, and, and I really respect that. So um, I have been at OHA for nine years uh, in this role as for six, um, but I've been doing this work for tribal communities um, for about 28 years. Um, I taught Head Start for the Americans of Warm Springs. Um, I lived on the World Change Reservation for five years. Um, I was working for the Burns White Tribe for 14 years um, in substance abuse prevention. I've been a certified prevention specialist for that time frame. Um, I have four daughters that are all enrolled in the Burns White Tribe. Um, and so that's why I'm here today. I'll let Caroline introduce herself. Uh, yes, good afternoon. This is uh, Caroline Cruz. I'm the Health and Human Services General Manager with the Confederate Tribes of uh, Warm Springs. Doug? Thank you, Caroline. Uh, so I'll go through the first uh, half of the slide presentation, and then I'll uh, turn it over to Caroline. I also want to recognize uh, Chief Doug Bennett from the Confederate of the Kuzla and Kwa who sits on this task force. Um, I've worked with both Doug and Caroline on this topic for over 20 years, and just really appreciate their commitment to this work as well. Um, go ahead. Next you, slide. You oh, that's where you gave this to me. Okay, thank you. <laughs> All right. <laughs> um, I'm going to uh, talk a little bit um, just around our role and and take us um, on a journey of where we're at and um, really focused on the subject. So uh, I first mentioned uh, I'm enrolled in the Fort McDermott Paiute Shoshone Tribe. Our reservation is on the Oregon Nevada border. Over half of our land is actually in Oregon, mm -hmm. um, but uh, it is considered a Nevada tribe. My great 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 grandfather lived on the um, Malheur Reservation, which was the original reservation in Eastern Oregon. Our treaty was never fully ratified through Congress after the Bannock War. Our people were imprisoned and marched to Fort Simcoe. Um, our people survived that persecution, and, and that's why I'm here today to do this work. My role at the Health Authority is to uphold the government to government relationship that we have with the nine federal organizations in Oregon. We like to say we do the all things tribal, all things health, from Medicaid to public health, behavioral health. Um, and everything in between. This is a very real um, piece of work for us. Uh, we believe in our purpose and serving our people and improving health in Indian country. It's much more than a job. This is our families, this is our friends, this is our communities and um, our people. So the first, uh, I won't read through everything. There's a lot of information you can look at in the slide deck, but just really starting at the top. Um, recognizing that federally recognized tribes are individual sovereign nations. This is a very unique relationship that the United States government has with tribal governments. It's called out in the Constitution, treaties, statutes, federal court decisions, and executive orders. It's really important that we honor and um, that we understand that so that we can honor and respect it because this is a legal and political relationship and it's not based on race. So when we talk about data, we get data from American Indian, Alaska Native. Um, that is separate and different than the legal and political relationship. 
Um, we currently have 574 federally recognized tribes across the nation. These are the designated tribes that have a relationship with the Bureau of Indian Affairs. Tribal sovereignty is a very important term. Um, again, that we recognize and honor that tribes have the authority to govern themselves within the borders of the United States of America. So for the state of Oregon, we are, we are dealing with nine sovereign nations within a nation. And then the federal trust uh, responsibility, just want to call that out because it's really important when it comes to health care. Um, again, all of those legal binding documents uh, provide guidance, support to tribal governments to provide health care to Indian people. The treaties that were signed with our ancestors were peace treaties. They were trying to avoid war and bloodshed. So when our land was stolen from us and our people were killed, alcohol was used during that time frame. And so for us to hold the federal government accountable to provide health care to Indian people, to hold the state of Oregon accountable as the Medicaid state authority and the behavioral health program, that's where we're coming from when we start to talk about alcohol use and the impacts on our people. Um, so that it really does start at the federal level. The Indian Health Service is the program that's um, developed to provide health care. Um, Medicaid is very, very important because it's another federal program to provide health care um, to our people. And then, of course, we'll get into tribal governments, cities, counties, um, everybody's role in that. So again, tribal governments are separate sovereign nations. Um, they are tasked with the protection of their health, safety, and welfare of their people and to govern their lands. Um, again, tribal sovereignty predates uh, the U.S. government and the state of Oregon. So when we think about tribal members that are living in our state, they are citizens of their tribes of Oregon. And we like to point out, since 1924, the United States of America. Now we know our creation stories that have been told to us passed down through our elders. We This is our land. Oregon will always be Indian country. Our people have been here since time immemorial. My daughter's an archaeologist for our tribe. With archaeological evidence, our people have been here for 18,000 years. So when we talk about that this is our land, these are our people, this is our health, that's what we're talking about. All of our Oregon tribal governments have either reservation trust land or other land that's held in trust. That is federal land held in trust for the use of the tribal government. And then every tribe deserves to determine their own citizenship, um, which we uh, refer to as tribal enrollment. I won't go into that topic today. There's a lot of um, details that come into that topic. Uh, so that's kind of the federal starting point. Um, now going to our state of Oregon, beautiful state of Oregon. Born and raised here. Never plan on leaving. <laughs> Again, honoring my ancestors' uh, relationship with the land. So uh, this is the state law that we still follow today. Uh, we refer to it still as the Senate Bill 775, of course, now into Oregon revised statutes. Um, Oregon was one of the first states to adopt formal legal um, government to government relationships defined through legislation. And so these are just kind of the key pieces that all state agencies have to follow along with our relationship with the governor's office and the legislative commission on Indian services. Um, I just want to point out here, not a lot of uh, task force committees, councils that know this, but the uh, definition of state agency that falls under this state law does include all committees, commissions, um, branches of the government. So by this task force, um, I hope that you know and understand what the law is and what that means to us um, in honoring government to government. And again, just, just really appreciate the invitation here today. Um, quick map of our beautiful state. Uh, the blue dots are showing uh, where our tribal headquarters are located. That's not all of the tribal land. Um, of course, our, our two treaty tribes that have a little bit more land, the reservation versus the six tribes that were terminated and the land that they've been acquiring back over time. Um, but just uh, showing you, reminding you again, uh, that we are in very rural areas of the state um, and kind of spread out throughout across the state. Um, and then here's just a list of our tribal governments. Anytime we were doing official uh, state business, we want to make sure we are using their full and complete name. Uh, we may reference the tribe Warm Springs, uh, Titi Kusi, um, but uh, we do want to use their full and complete federally recognized name. Um, you probably can't see it, it's kind of small up there on the screen, but um, I just also want to recognize the tribes and bands that actually make up those tribes. 
So for the confederated tribes, that means that many tribes were brought together to create that one um, confederated tribe. So we have nine federally recognized tribes today. Um, in 2024, historically, we had many, many, many more. Um, also, want to just give a quick um, shout out, Paul, for our urban Indian health program. We do only have one designated urban Indian health program in our state. That is not Northwest. That's a federal designation through Indian Health Service. We have a very large urban Indian uh, population um, in our state. And so it's really important that we partner with NARA Northwest to provide health services to our Indian people living um, in the Portland metro area. Um, we have tribes from across the nation living in Portland, not just the nine Oregon tribes. And so they do a really great job of, of serving our urban Indian population. So I would love to welcome a little bit of time for you to participate in an activity if you're willing. Um, I'll try not to take too much time, but um, it's really important for me to help you understand why we do this work mm -hmm. and why this topic is so important to us. So you obviously don't have to do it if you don't want to, but I um, offer a healthy risk, which we like to talk about, um, to participate in this. So it's just going to take a few minutes if you're willing and able. I'd like you to think on a piece of paper, you can do it on your phone or computer, however way you want to do it, um, and make a list of the 10 most important things in your life. And this is your list, whatever comes to your mind. Um, you'll have opportunity to share a little bit if you want to, but you don't have to. But uh, right now, the 10 most important things in your life. And don't get ten. That's okay. Um, is anybody willing to share something off of their list? My business. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Family, friends, health, ability to make a living, employment. <laughs> <laughs> anybody else or online? Okay. I can't see so, the chat, but if somebody wants to so lower up the chat, yeah. so lower. Um, I have helping my community, uh, being out in nature, and just joy, like all the things that I love to do, the hiking and being with my family. Yeah, I think I saw Rob's hand. Can you hear me all right? Yes. Uh, I had God, family, community, and my mental health. Thank you. I really appreciate everybody participating and, and, and being willing to share that. So, so now I want you to take a look at your list, and I want you to cross off the first five things. Those things are now gone, and you will never have them back. Does anybody want to share how that makes them feel? Devastating. Yeah. Isolated. Traumatizing them, huh? So I heard devastated, isolated, traumatized, empty, empty. Again, thank you for participating and sharing. I really appreciate it. So this is what historical trauma is to Indian people. Historical trauma refers to cumulative, psychological, and emotional wounding extending over an individual lifespan and across generations caused by traumatic experiences. So when we talk about historical trauma, we're also talking about intergenerational trauma, what's happened to our parents, our grandparents, our great-grandparents, and the impact that, that makes on us today. Um, nowadays, we have a lot of research done on epigenetics and the ACEs study and these things that are telling us that the Jimmy people have known all their lives. So things like loss of people, complete tribes wiped out by, by war, by sickness, uh, individuals, families, communities, again, whole bands and tribes, loss of land. Again, we know that this land, all of this land, all of this country wasn't originally our land. Loss of our culture. We were not allowed to practice our religions, our spirituality, our singing, our dancing. It was all outlawed. Our people were killed for it. Loss of language. 
we were not allowed to speak our traditional words. That's why I introduced myself the way that I do, because we're taught that our ancestors here. The boarding school era, which you may or may not be familiar with. Uh, I live in Salem now, but left home to, to take this work on. Um, Birch Mount Indian School is it's actually one of the oldest ran boarding schools in the nation, still ran today. Our children were stolen, our baby, preschool age through high school, where they were forced to live in these government ran boarding schools, where they were neglected, abused, and died. The policy at that time was kill the Indian and save the man. There is a cemetery at Chamawa where our children are buried right now. And then the Relocation Act um, and the Termination Act. Again, I don't want to go too deep into these subjects right now. This would be a whole day discussion. Um, but the Termination Act hit Oregon very, very hard. Six of our tribes today were all terminated. The federal government said we're no longer going to recognize you as Indian people. And then the Relocation Act was. Um, you know, we're going to give you a job and we're going to give you a place to live and we want you to leave your homeland and we'll live in Portland or LA or Phoenix or Minneapolis, um, huge cities across the nation. Portland was a relocation site, one of the reasons why we have a large urban Indian population. It's estimated as much as 95% of our population was wiped out through federal policies of removal, determination, relocation, and assimilation. And this was all unfamiliar to our people. Again, through our creation stories, through our traditional beliefs and values, we have been practicing our medicines, traditional medicines, you know, emotional, spiritual health since time of memorial. Our mind, our body, and our spirits have always been connected. When we talk about care coordination, when we talk about access to care, when we talk about culturally responsive care, our people have always had that. All of this try to take away from us. And so the reason why I do this activity and I, I share this information is because a lot in public health, we talk about our environment, where we live, where we work, where we play, and how that impacts our health today. We all have the choice to get up every day and either drink water or drink something else. We all have the choice to eat healthy foods or not. But when you live in a community that has been devastated by genocide for over 500 years, it makes things a little bit different. I lived on the Birds Prairie Reservation for 14 years. It's the smallest reservation in our state, both by population and by land base. Before that, I lived in Warm Springs, which is one of our larger tribes by population, largest by land base. So I know, and, and part of my job is going out to tribal communities and being there and sitting with the elders, sitting with the leaders, sitting with the youth and the family to hear from them, what can the state of Oregon do to help improve health in Indian country. So I spend a lot of time in the community. And so I always think to myself as I work for the state of Oregon now, you know, how many people in Oregon, how many Oregonians know what life is like on the reservation? And so that's why I do this. Um, just to, I can't, I can't teach you to understand this, but I can hope that you can think about it you can feel about it and understand just a little bit of why we're here and, and what we're here to talk about and how it impacts our tribal people. We'll switch gears a little bit just to talk about some population data. Data, you know, data can be twist, turned, shown, changed every which way you want to do it. Um, and I'm going to show a couple other data slides, but it depends on who you're talking to, it depends on what numbers you're looking at, and it depends on how you want to have that conversation. So here's just some, some starting points to think about. 177,000 American Alaska Natives, that's a lone or in combination with another race. We are a mixed race. This is all self-identified data. You don't have to be a full-blooded Indian to count yourself as an Indian. Um, again, that all goes back to tribal enrollment, tribal descendancy blood quantum requirements, which was all set up by the federal government um, to, again, wipe our people out. This is the census data. Uh, 58,000 in the Portland metro, uh, metro area, again, Portland was a relocation site, really specific to the Oregon Health Plan. Uh, you'll notice we have a high number in fee-for-service open card. Um, it is against federal law to auto-assign Indian people into a managed care. So in our state, where we have a huge CCO system, um, Indian people have to choose. So they can choose to go into a CCO 
But if you're living on a reservation, receiving culturally responsive care your entire life, why would you need to be in a So this is just a really important point that we like to make. Um, anybody that is designated American Alaska Native or OHP is a very special designation, Heritage Native American, and that makes sure that they get the federal protections that we have, again, through the federal trust funded responsibility to provide health care. Um, just really quickly on our Indian health care delivery system, uh, we refer to it as ITU. The I stands for Indian Health Service. We have two Indian Health Service clinics in our state, one operated uh, at Shmau Indian School. Um, we do have students there today. There's usually about 400 students there coming from across the nation. Um, right now they have about 200, I think, it's the last count I heard. Um, they, you know, it's hard to have staffing, full-time staffing, boarding school there. Um, and so the numbers have gone down a little bit coming out of COVID. Um, but we have, they have a full clinic there, um, physical health, mental health, dental, optometry, um, to serve the needs of those students. But any um, person that qualifies for Indian Health Service can also uh, receive services there. I think my friends in there, I think the regular thing she mentioned, all of them, they treat them very well. I'm grateful for that. Uh, Warm Springs, Caroline can talk more about this. Uh, they run both the IHS clinic and the Tribal 638 side, um, so they do a little bit of both. Um, the net T stands for tribally operated. That refers uh, to 638 contracts. Public Law 93638 uh, is the Indian Self-Determination Act, which says that tribes can have contracts with the federal government to receive that funding and uh, run their programs the way that they see fit. Um, so all of our eight organs, the other eight organ tribes and more strings uh, run their clinics that way. And then as I mentioned, uh, NARA is our urban Indian health program. Our tribes have some of the most beautiful, brand new, uh, comprehensive service clinics in our state. Um, I don't visit a lot of other clinics, but um, I know that the uh, Yellow Hawk Tribal Health Center has built a new clinic. Uh, Coke Wells built a new clinic. Warm Springs is getting ready to do um, some remodeling on their clinic. Um, but they are, you know, trying to meet the need of their people the best they can. Uh, they don't all offer these services, but um, they're, they're continuously expanding. Um, very limited resources. Uh, IHS is estimated to be funded about 30% of the need, and they've always been that way. Um, that's estimates given by tribal leaders, not by Indian Health Service. Um, and again, that's why the state support in uh, providing funding to tribes for um, both Medicaid and behavioral health services outside of the Medicaid uh, is so very important. Uh, during COVID, some of our tribes were literally standing up public health programs in the middle of the pandemic. So they can do testing, they can do um, you know, vaccines, they can do all of that stuff that was needed during the pandemic. Um, they did quite an amazing job. Uh, <clears throat> I just wanted to mention really quickly a note on service areas. So again, a lot of this work is negotiated at the federal level when it comes to um, those things. And so uh, when you think of a tribe and going back to the map I showed earlier, you know, tribes are not just providing services on the reservation or in in their county. So I use Celeste as an example. When you think of Celeste, you may think of Lincoln County and the coast. Celeste actually has an 11 county service area. So that means any tribal members that are living in those 11 counties, the tribe is providing services to them. So we have uh, many tribes have offices, Portland, Salem, Eugene, Medford, um, Roseburg, to, to, to provide those services. That's why um, Coquille has just opened up another clinic in Eugene. For that. Here's some data again. You know, data is really hard for me because when we look at numbers, as other people may look at them, they're just numbers on a paper. For me, this isn't just numbers on a paper. This is my children. This is student, student health survey data, six, eighth, and 11th graders that identify as American and Alaska Native. Rates for our tribal kids are much higher than the state average for past 30 day use of alcohol. <clears throat> They're also much higher for uh, five or more drinks of alcohol. We've seen this data improve over the years. Again, as I shared, I've done this work for 20 years, um, but we've still got a long ways to go. Um, <clears throat> talked a little bit earlier about alcohol-related deaths. Um, this came from our state health assessment a number of years ago. I don't know if it's an updated or not, but I need to get that data. <laughs> um, you can you can see it, and, and you know the data. 
like I said, it can be interpreted lots of ways. It can be argued lots of ways. But if you look at a chart like this, it's kind of hard to argue with that. I can't count them any, the amount of people anymore. I've lost it. I'll call this how many people I've buried by them. And then here's some national data. Just shows that I think there was a question earlier around substances. It's still showing that alcohol is the drug of choice for people. We know opioids are killing our people. We know meth is killing our people. We know that marijuana is still an issue, even though it's legal. Alcohol is still the drug of choice for our family. When it's used against you to be forced to sign a tree, and Indian people have not been using alcohol the way that it has been in Europe for thousands of years, it's different. I've been to Europe where they drink beer for breakfast in Germany. They couldn't drink their water because it wasn't clean enough. So they had to drink beer, wine, whatever in Europe. So our people have not been exposed to alcohol the same way as Europeans have been. Um, I'm going to turn it over to my great mentor and friend and auntie, Caroline. Uh, she's been doing this work way longer than I have. Um, and I'll let her talk about some of the partnerships and, and the work they're doing in World Spring. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, I'd like to thank the task force uh, for inviting us to be part of this conversation. So I'm going to kind of go back in terms of history. Thank you. Julie for setting that foundation and thank you Doug for being over there you know watching uh, over us here. So I've been in the field for many many years like Julie said. Um, I started working in the field in 1977 here with the Confederate Tribes of Warren Springs which I am a tribal member here and at that time there was hardly any funds available in order for me to oversee the alcohol and drug program that I was hired uh, to do at that time. So when I started seeking funds at the state level, I realized there was a house bill that was called House Bill 2145, and it was supposed to target some of the alcohol and drug beer and wine tax towards minority programs. I understand it hasn't been since the mid uh, 70s in terms of, of the beer and wine tax in terms of being uh, increased. So there wasn't very much money at that time to target into minority programs. So in the early 80s, 1980s, uh, the Native American people who I could find within the state, because again, like Julie said, that out of 104 tribes that have been terminated, 64 was in the state of Oregon. And so some of the newer tribes were just being reinstated and they didn't have time, they didn't have the infrastructure in order to set up alcohol and drug programs. That wasn't their priority at the time. It was a set up their government. And so I primarily uh, worked with folks who I could find in terms of for we for us to be a voice, you know, at the table because we could not access dollars uh, at that time. And so we started what we call the alcohol and drug directors meeting. And then we are now currently called the Oregon Indian Council of Addictions. And so we have more than 40 years of history of working uh, together uh, to be a voice for Native American communities as well as other minority communities. It was in the 90s where um, we were able, at that time in 1987, I actually got recruited to work at the state level. And one of the things that I was doing was setting up prevention and setting up certification process, uh, working with all the counties as well as the federally uh, nine recognized tribe, the NARA program, Chamawa, the NEA program, the Native American Youth Association, uh, stands for uh, uh, NAIA. Uh, NARA is a Native American Rehabilitation uh, Program uh, that's uh, in the uh, metro uh, area. And there was not sufficient funds. We were able to get a SAMHSA grant, uh, which is the uh, uh, Substance Abuse Mental Health uh, Services Association in order to start targeting some community mobilization dollars towards the nine uh, tribes. We were able to get involved with the two state grant with the state of uh, Washington. And this is where we start setting up systems, the infrastructure. Uh, we start doing the best that we can in terms of learning all the latest theories, the research 
around how to do a good comprehensive approach to not only prevention, but treatment and aftercare. So this is where the model that the state of Oregon, when I was working there, we decided to, to establish the framework for prevention, utilizing risk and protective factors, and to use what we call the six prevention strategies to do comprehensive uh, treat, I mean, prevention programs, not only within the state, but with the nine tribes and NARA. It was in 2003 where the evidence-based practice law uh, was passed at that time. And they said by the year 2009, 75% of dollars coming through the state, may it be state, federal, other type of county dollars, that we have to have 75% of our program to be evidence-based. At that time, we realized that tribal programs were probably not gonna be funded. So we created the tribal-based practices with which I'm one of the uh, current main authors in terms of, of that whole practice that's totally based on risk protective factors, the national outcome measurements in order to do, uh, to return back to our tribal risk practice because we truly believe that it does decrease risk factors and increase protective factors. The last three days, I've been doing uh, certified prevention specialist training because thank you, Julie and her uh, crew, in terms of realizing that we need to develop the workforce, not only for uh, certified prevention specialists, but for, for our certified alcohol and drug counselors also. And so we started that new process. Again, we got behind because of COVID, but we're trying to develop our workforce in order for us to do the jobs that we need to do because we are getting a lot of funding and we thank wherever those funding sources come from, but we need a, workforce in order for us to use utilize those dollars in the correct uh, ma uh, manner. Uh, we've been very fortunate in terms of advocating for set aside because again, the Oregon Indian Council on Addiction, we hold quarterly meetings, I think since the late 90s with our uh, prevention treatment uh, folks, are those folks who are trying to prevent suicide and also uh, those trying to prevent uh, a uh, gambling you know, addiction. We've been meeting on a quarterly basis since the late 90s. So we have more than 20 years of all the nine tribes in NARA meeting on a consistent uh, basis. We could go to the next slide. Uh, one of the things that we've been doing with behavioral health funding is the fact that many of our programs in the past have not received sufficient dollars. We've learned to, to collaborate. We, we've learned to, to utilize the different types of funding from our different sectors that are coming within the tribes. And so we can make a dollar go to $10, or even possibly $100, because we never had those dollars. But we're very, very, very thankful that recently, probably just within the last five years, we have been getting a lot of carve out dollars directed uh, to the tribes. Uh, as a result, we're able to at least support at least one uh, full time employee for alcohol, tobacco, and other drug prevention. We've also been able to direct some uh, dollars for substance use disorder to support outpatient treatment for non-Medicaid uh, clients. We have two of our tribes who are doing an intoxicated driver uh, program, which is gonna fit in with uh, the new uh, House Bill 4002 that's going to go in the direction of, of um, deflection, which is a form of a, um, a type of a driver education or, or a intoxicated type broken or diversion type program. Most of our programs are already set up in order to do that. We're also very appreciative of our tribal housing assistant that one of our tribe is receiving and we are utilizing community housing services for the rest of the tribes and NARA in order to provide housing assistance for our uh, members. The measure 110, that supports the uh, the burn uh, um, function. All our nine tribes are getting a uh, dollars uh, set aside, as well as our NARA uh, program. And I do sit on Measure 110 Accountability Board. I also sit on the Alcohol and Drug Policy Commission. Uh, and so I'm connecting the dots all the time and making sure that the voices of the tribes are being heard. All the tribes also receive behavioral health residential and housing as a one-time amount. And we did receive behavioral health 
uh, workforce dollars in order to develop the capacity within our uh, tribes. The next slide. Uh, did I did I go too fast? No, you're good. <laughs> oh, okay. It's not on my handout here in front of me. Let me go back to the screen here. Uh, we also use uh, the dollars with the burn to. There's been a lot of, uh, I think, most of our tribes do peer support and recovery services. And so most of us are able to increase the number of people that we've been hiring, because in terms of the research that we're seeing, peer support is, is having more of an impact because they're doing outreach. They're going to the people versus waiting for the people to come into the office that usually our outcome direct counselors require them to go into the office. Our peer support will actually go to where our people are at. We're also using the dollars for emergency transitional supportive and permanent housing. And even though a lot of us are having trouble in terms of getting contractors to help us with permanent housing, we are moving in that direction to create more opportunity for our folks who are going into treatment to be able to have a place to come back that is a, a, a safe a place for them to return to. We also have been able to access more treatment. Uh, we're expanding our each um, and we're doing a lot of harm reduction and we're doing more referrals to treatment and we're creating respite housing uh, for our community and that are all culturally appropriate in order to support the recovery. Next slide. To take it a little bit closer to home because I've been talking about all the tribes as well as our urban area. I just wanted to bring it a little bit closer here because I like I said I've been doing the three day uh, training and we know in Native American community, and there's a lot of research with our Northwest Portland uh, Professional Consortium, which is an evaluation firm that's been evaluating the juvenile crime uh, prevention dollars uh, since the late 1990s. So they have more than 20 years of research that they've been doing. And so what happens is in, in order for our tribal uh, youth to get onto this program, they have to have at least four risk factors. What we do then with those kids that once they're identified, we return them uh, to uh, our different uh, coordinators who return them back to their culture. We're doing travel-based practice with these young people. And when we compare that with the county in terms of those kids in the uh, prevention, uh, juvenile crime prevention program, our kids' recidivism was a lot lower by them returning them back to their culture. And the reason why we believe that's happening is because of the fact that our travel-based practices are based on risk factors and they're providing opportunity, they're providing skills, and they're providing recognition, which is the key research for bonding. So our kids, as they return back and they listen to their teachers, which is our elders here, and they're returning back to their culture, they're regaining their identity, and we see recidivism actually going down. So when I look at these programs, here, I do know people are gonna say, hey, what are you doing with those dollars? That doesn't look like that's the correct use of money. We're using our tobacco dollars here in the Warren Springs to renovate an old school cafeteria. We all know in order to build a brand new building it is almost cost prohibitive in terms of the amount. So we're remodeling the old school cafeteria, but we're gonna be using that cafeteria for trainings to provide uh, sobriety dinners, uh, to do our 4-H clubs, to teach our young people about traditional foods and how to prepare that. Not only our young people, Julie talked about the boarding school incident. We have a lot of our folks in their 50s and 60s who never had the opportunity to know how to prepare their traditional food because that was taken away. And they've been too embarrassed in order to say, I don't know how to do that. So we're gonna be teaching uh, anyone who wants to come in to learn how to prep traditional food. Back to board classes, we actually reduce SIDS. Uh, I used to be on the state fatality task force. And one of our tasks was to not only identify why something was happening, but, but to come up with prevention. We found out that you need to put your baby back on its back that first year. The study came out of Europe and Canada. Because of boarding school, it interrupted a lot of our traditions. And we were not putting our babies on a, a baby board or a cradle. Once we returned back to that practice, and I did a 10-year study uh, with Warren Springs, we almost reduced SIDS to zero. 
by returning our baby back to a baby board because naturally they were on their back. So we're also gonna be doing our classes within, we, we do have other places to do classes now, but because we're using tobacco funds, we're gonna make sure that the back to work classes is held there because they also teach about the consequences of low birth rate, what tobacco does in terms of contributing to low birth rate uh, and uh, to um, uh, preemies. And so we also gonna have the opportunity to teach that in terms of staying away, not only from, from tobacco, but other substance. We'll be doing our sobriety celebrations. We'll also be housing our tobacco coordinator and our smoke sensation coordinator uh, in that cafeteria building. Another uh, use of funds is the system of care, was just known as SOC uh, grants. And we were given the opportunity to do what we want for the community, not necessarily targeting a behavior problem, but to use it for our needs at the community level. So we were able to rehab a 75 year old basketball court that's been in use for 75 years, but it was unleveled. Uh, the um, basketball hoops were, were all, all, all falling apart. And so we used some of the funds to rebuild that. And every day you see people utilizing uh, that basketball court. Basketball court is a way in terms of our people to come together as groups in a positive way, instead of maybe turning to gangs or other type of things. And so we see that again in terms of, of a protective factor. We also rehab two playgrounds and build a third playground within the reservation. And we actually bought Little League uniforms. And I remember when I was talking to the funders and they were saying Little League uniforms? Well, you know, a lot of our communities, they do fundraising, they, do, uh, they get sponsors, and they sponsored the Little League teams. We, didn't, we don't have that. Our enterprises are not making the money that we need. And so we decided to put it in Little League uniforms. And just to see those little kids knowing that they have a uniform that was equivalent to the other people that they played when they left the reservation. I mean, it's just so heartwarming to see the fact that this community would actually help them with these uniforms. The other thing that we're doing with the Measure 110 is uh, we're doing our shelter to independent living. We average probably between 15 uh, folks in our homeless uh, shelter, and we're using other funds uh, that we uh, are giving from behavioral health in order to move them into a permanent housing. So we're gonna be opening 12 units probably within the next two months and trying to move both people in the homeless shelter into permanent housing and to try to help them become uh, independent. So we have the ability to do 23 individuals right now. We uh, offer them three meals per day. So we average from 75 to 100 meals that we provide on a daily 24-7 um, um, that we offer them up to 100 meals. And we welcome walk-ins and uh, we feed the residents who are there and the walk-ins. We have a little mini laundry mat. When I mean by mini, there are just two washers, two washing machines and two dryers. We provide five restrooms uh, with showers. Uh, you can go to the next slide. Um, the other thing is, is that we're putting the pavilion up, a community pavilion, in order for them to come in to have family gatherings, uh, to do like a little mini powwows, uh, round dances, uh, it's a location for our community to come that is a safe location. We have cameras there. We're putting uh, four ADA uh, restrooms uh, that is going to be uh, used with non-porous material because of the mess issue that we have here. Uh, we're going to have, there's not going to be any fixtures that are exposed so no one can steal uh, some of the, um, uh, the faucets and whatever. Uh, so it'll be pretty well if there's any meth contamination, we could easily uh, clean it and that it will be uh, the lead lighting so that we could save on electricity. It'll be the type that when you enter, the lights will go on, when you leave, the lights will go off, but it's a needed thing for our community, for the public. We're gonna be putting a veterans honoring wall there. We're gonna be putting a big, huge projection screen with a surround, oops, system is spelled wrong, to offer. Uh, we're going to um, 
do family movie nights. And people were saying, well, why are you doing that? The closest theater is, um, is uh, 30 miles away. Depending on where you live on a reservation, it could be up to 60 miles away to just go to a movie theater. We don't want our people to be out there in the nighttime when the roads are not drivable because we do get extreme weather system. And so we do have a person here who provides movie nights. He uses the blow up screens and it's outside. This way he'll have a protected area and a place for our people to gather and to offer other uh, activities. Uh, we also get a community housing services and this is all related to substance use disorder uh, because of the fact that some of our people who are not working are people who inherited their home. They, they need some of the house repairs so we could um, prevent homelessness. And so we do have some grant money that we've been helping people with home repairs, uh, putting uh, new roofs on their house, helping them with past utilities, past mortgages, and doing what we can uh, for our community. Uh, I think that's it, right? Next next slide. Yes. So uh, Julie, did you want to talk about this one? I This is included in my regular training. If you're interested in learning more about the tribes, um, Legislation Services has a great website. Um, if you've never seen the documentary Broken Treaties done by OPB, it's only an hour long. It actually goes into the history of all my tribes and interviews um, current day leadership. It's a few years old now, but it's still really good if you're just interested in learning any of that. Uh, we Shall Remain is a beautifully done, um, actually, music video really talking about historical trauma and healing. It was done by a youth group. Um, out of Coeur d'Alene, Idaho, um, but it's just a few minute long uh, music video, and then just more on the boarding school era. I've, I've trained about 100 and something DOJ attorneys, and they really wanted to know more about um, boarding schools and historical trauma, so just added those resources in there for you if you um, are interested in learning more about, you know, why we do this work. Um, there's me and Caroline when we're at the grand opening of their homeless shelter. Um, uh, it was a really beautiful day. So. so thank you so much for your presentation, um, Caroline and Julia. I, I do have questions. I'm sure I'm sure I'm sure that why not we just say it out loud? I'm sure this presentation was probably hard, right? For some of you. And maybe you have a lot of questions that you're shy about asking because it is. It feels hard, but I will give you this: that you know, this is because coming from a Native American perspective, this is why this is so damn important to me. It's why it's so hugely important because it's affected my community so immensely, right? And so I want I want to ask the harder than question because I know. Uh, Caroline, you talked about all the great things that are being done, in particular on Warm Springs, and some of the resources that have been accessed through various places. Um, but one of the things that I know is that despite all of the efforts and the ability to stretch a dollar like nobody's business, um, you mentioned like the, the different housing opportunities or things that were trying to happen. What's the deficit? What's what you mean? 23 individuals uh, maybe, you know, being able to be housed in these these units, or you have folks hopefully exiting treatment programs and needing to be in some level of transitional housing. What is the deficit? What is actually needed? We can get people into housing, but how much housing or, or resources in terms of, you know, ongoing uh, substance use uh, support services and those types of things, what's actually needed? Well, I, I think it's kind of hard to answer that because of the fact that I, I do know that I, I could talk about some barriers because I know that the need is always going to be there. We're always going to need more housing. We're always going to need a lot more resources. But the barriers has been the fact that we cannot get contractors because we're remote. Um, and the fact that when we do get contractors is the fact that uh, we tend to have to pay more because of distance. Uh, we, we have to pay more for plumbers, electricians, uh, carpenters, because we're so remote. 
we also, the other barriers that we have here in the Warren Springs is the fact that though there is money coming to us in terms of helping with our uh, infrastructure for our water system, that still is very slow in terms of happening. And so I can't build homes if I don't have water that I could bring to that particular uh, area. So, so a lot of the deficits are, are more so, uh, uh, Tana, is, is more so in terms of getting the resources to us. And because I have money right now, right, I'm supposed to build 10 homes, but it, it's a long process in order to do that. I have to find an area where there's water. I have to find an area where we could bring electricity, where we could uh, build the roads. And so that money doesn't go as far as uh, as I want it. When COVID hit, I was able to buy six trailers, no, well, actually seven. And I got it for a bargain. I was so happy, 105,000. And I said, yay, that's a steal. They were old FEMA trailers. Um, they had been donated to our housing, but we bargained and I got it for 105. In order to put in those seven trailers, though, it cost me close to eight hundred thousand dollars, to um, because the land where I, I placed them did not have um, the water, I mean the plumbing or the piping there. It didn't have the electricity. Uh, I had to pay for all that to to prepare the land to bring the uh, foundation to put the trailers on. And I didn't count on eight hundred thousand dollars, and I thought it was. I thought I had the houses uh, or the trailers, and it was only going to cost me a couple hundred thousand dollars to put them up. I was not prepared for that. So I'm a little bit more prepared when we put the the tiny homes up. We only have to put the foundation, and because we only have to bring electricity, we didn't have to bring in the water. So the cost there was a little bit more prepared. I want to build ten homes, but 10 homes is is not, if 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 I was able to build for 120,000 two bedroom, I know I'm gonna to have to have another hundred thousand dollars to develop the, the land in order to bring in. And so the money doesn't go as far. So we could build as many homes as we can or want if we have more money, but we don't have the infrastructure to do that. Does that kind of clarify that, Tana? Oh, and Dwight Holden told me to tell you hi, Tana, because I just left him to come to this meeting. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> well, that yes, and um, and I I well, I'll let some other folks ask ask some questions as well. I think you you also mentioned um, the the workforce, uh, and I know that the workforce for everyone is a is a difficult issue, um, and knowing that the workforce may be not just on Warm Springs, but in, in other areas is also an issue. Do you have any ideas or concept or uh, uh, maybe just information about that in terms of who's who's in deficit of the workforce to be able to do the behavioral health work that's needed throughout Indian country? So I think Doug has something to add or say, Doug? Okay, perfect. I see Doug's hand up. Yes, go for it. Oh. Nope, now you can hear me, I'll bet. Can hear you. Yeah. Right yeah. button. Anyway, I just um Nisha and Asa, I used to want to heat. I'm just want to add that um we're also building a clinic in Coos Bay for our tribe too, and we're gonna possibly also go to Florence with a remote and Eugene too. So we're we're expanding our healthcare system too because it's needed for a lot of our folks. And you know, we're all look we're always looking for housing because that's one of the major problems too. And so I just wanted to also say that that canoe that you saw in that picture while you were doing that was Tai. That was our canoe. And canoe journey is one of the tribal best practices. It's just a, one of the largest drug and alcohol free event in the Pacific Northwest, it might be the world, where 10,000 people all show up at the end of the canoe landing. And it's pretty awesome. I mean, it's just, it's awesome to get the kids out there in the, in the water and paddle. And, you know, so we got over a hundred canoes that usually land at the landing with probably over 10,000 people that show up at the end. So we got Alaska, Canada coming down from North. 
we come up from the south we all meet in one designated tribe and it's just it's an ongoing evolutionary recovery type program so it's one of our tribal best practices thank you that's it thank you thank you chief Barrett. Um, and and i will be dual zooming here shortly i got to get on another meeting at three o'clock okay we're gonna we're gonna end by three i promise yes sir uh, uh, in terms of getting back to your question, thank you, Doug, is, is the fact that um, when we had carve out money for Measure 110, it was a decision of the nine tribes and um, ANARA that we would carve out some of those dollars to train our workforce. And so we contracted, uh, or Julie did, contracted with the Northwest Port and the Health Board in order for them to provide that training. And so we are now um, in that phase in terms of, of training our, uh, our treatment uh, workforce in terms of them becoming certified alcohol drug uh, counselors. That process takes still at least two years in order for them to become certified. Uh, also, uh, we have been discussing for quite some time in terms of training our prevention workforce. And so, um, we put a team together and we're putting all the trainers together. And that's what I did the last three days. We have 32 people sign up for that class. There was a time uh, when I worked for the state where we actually had a work had a training unit and we uh, trained every year. That was dissolved back around 2015. And so we've gone through nine years where there has not been uh, training available that's been sponsored at that time was the Addiction and Mental Health Division. And so we're doing this with the uh, Native American Behavior Health in, in terms of finding ways in, in order to get this training done. So a lot of the trainers such as me, we're not charging you know, uh, for this training. We're trying to do this because our people need uh, this training. And so uh, some of the folks, because they are private contractors, are dependent upon being um, paid. But we have always had a historical history of getting our folks and allowing them to uh, be a, a part of their agreement in terms of the funding that we give them when I was with the state in order for them to come and provide training and get their supervisor to allow to do that so we could develop the workforce. That's how we've done it in the past. And I think we're trying to do something similar because of the fact we do don't have prevention specialists. We don't have uh, uh, certified alcohol drug counselors. We don't have mental health therapists. We don't have tribal psychiatrists. We don't have that. So I, I guess we're just going to try to pursue what we can. But I wish, in, in my opinion, that Oregon Health Authority or the health systems or who whatever is left in terms of their title, because that didn't exist when I left. We were the Addictions and Mental Health Division that was clear and distinct. And we provided prevention, treatment, aftercare services for substance use disorder and mental health. And so I, I wish we could actually put more money into an actual, um, I don't know what you're gonna call it, training unit, workforce development unit, but we really have a, a, a need for that. Not only for the tribes, but I see this for the counties also. Thank you, Tanya. Thank you. Um, Sean Colmer, this might be for you, Julie. Um, outside of Medicaid, is, I mean, the slide that really resonated with me was the cobbling together of all the one time funds. Outside of Medicaid, is there a base consistent resource allocation to the tribes for any of these services? Yeah. Okay, I think that's an easy answer. I, I was assuming that's what the answer was, but I wanted to check. Okay. And I just wanted to add, add on to your question. So OHA is doing two different studies right now. One I think is complete around the behavioral health workforce needs and those being identified, tribes are included in that group, as well as the funding, um, the whole report on all behavioral health funding that, that we're partnering with uh, the contractor with on right now. We're actually, we have pulled all that. Um, and, and that's why I included not the amounts on the slide, but the buckets on the slide. The, the ongoing funding that's been going since 90s, 2000s is so minimal. The, the one-time funding, the measure 110, because we don't know how long that's going to last, 
the workforce and the housing have been great boosts to our tribes, but they're one time. So that's not very helpful in the long term sustainable needs of our community. But that information will be included in those two studies. Thank you very much. Thank you, um, Craig Prince, OLCC. I was glad that you did the background, Julie. Um, and with that history of trauma, how do you do prevention? You know, I'm thinking of Dr. Tom and Rethink the Drink, and we you know what we do. With that history of trauma, how do you do adult prevention? Is it different? Is it different from the way I think of it as excessive drinking means this, binge drinking means this? How does that change the messaging? Or does it? Thank you. I really appreciate that question. We had a lot of mixed feelings on Rethink the Drink. I'm talking about tribal prevention specialists and tribal leaders and myself personally. When you're living in an active addiction, right. you can't rethink the drink. And that's that's the world that we're living in, right? And so it is exactly the whole thing. And that's why we started is acknowledging the trauma and not living in that, right? You have to acknowledge it and learn from it and move on. And so that's, excuse me, why the risk and protective factors are so important. Right. That's why our tribal based practices are so important. Mm -hmm. That's why using the scientific based framework mm -hmm. is so important because the strategic prevention framework is really about the local community identifying, you know, is it crime? Is it healthcare? Is it family, community, you know, health welfare issues that's happening because of the alcohol use? Mm -hmm. Letting the community identify those things and let them prioritize and then decide as a community what are the needs to respond that way. Mm -hmm. So when we mentioned the 60 that strategy, you know, is that information up to the community? Is that training? Is that alternative activities where alcohol and drugs are not going to be a part of it and we're going to offer it to the community? Is it that problem idea and referral? So using the framework that's based out of SAMHSA, because that's where our block grant comes from, again, that minimal funding, it still comes from the Fed, and they have a framework, and so that's what we need to follow, and we need to make it specific for tribes, and we need to let tribes and communities make it specific yeah. for their communities. Thank you. Can I ask Julie about prevention for kids? Because it looks like some of your numbers are tracking numbers from OHA generally about um, kids drinking less, and I'm curious if we have any success with some of your prevention programs. Yes, absolutely. That kind of goes back to the research that. Um, Caroline mentions with juvenile crime prevention. We haven't done as much um, with substance use prevention, substance use prevention, but um, absolutely. I mean, again, when many of our reservations are actually dry reservations, it's actually illegal to have alcohol on the reservation, but yet we're looking at these huge rates of usage. So it goes back to tribal law and work codes. Um, tribal police and you know involvement there, MIPs and DUIs. Um, when your family members are using and it's generational, your parents, your grandparents, your great grandparents, how do you support that youth that's trying not to drink? I don't. I have not looked at this statistic in a long time. Although the rates are really high for Americans up to date, we're also one of the highest populations to completely abstain from alcohol. I have not drank alcohol since I was 16 years old. Why? Because they're very too many these ones. So a lot of our kids that we do this work with, they've seen it, they've lived it, they understand it, and they make a commitment at an early age to never touch alcohol. And that's a big support. Um, and it plays out in every family differently, um, but that's why it's important that we rely on our, our tribal-based practices, our risk and protective factors, all of the things that we know work to continue to support that. It's working with the schools, it's working with the juvenile department, it's working with child welfare, and then letting the tribe honor their sovereignty and take care of the people the way that needs to be. But all that has to be a partnership across the board with the cities, with the counties, with the state, and all of it. So can I just tell you about what, oh, sorry, I'll get you to do it. So I just want to recognize, though, that, and we've got just a few minutes left here, but the um, the identification of the of, of the distinct population and distinct uh, impact of historical, long-term historical trauma, long-term, you know, alcohol or all of those different kinds of things. That is a, um, it's a two-year course 
like it, a college course. It really, truly is. And many of our, the Indian Child Welfare Act, the, you know, the uh, Indian blood quantum, you know, the legal laws and all those t things that, that affect tribal populations, that is a master's degree. Like there, you will not know this. You can't, you can't know this like people who were born and raised in it and know all of these types of things. I mean, you know, Caroline Cruz, you know, along with John, Dr. John Spencer, the authors of that piece of, of, of documentation that got us to a place where we can do our practice-based evidence versus an uh, evidence-based practice model, which is totally inappropriate for tribal populations. There is so much more to learn about this, but I really want to identify that it is so very distinct and different than what you will recognize in other populations with regard to this issue. So. Please ask questions of you know myself, Julie, Caroline. If we get a chance to do that, um, Chief Barrett. There are so many things that are being done in Indian Country that are very, very different, yeah. that are very distinct, and that affect our population differently. It's it's a it's a longer conversation. So again, I'm sorry. Uh, first, I, actually, I apologize for going so long because I think this is a conversation we'd like to engage in for longer. But I, I do have a question on. On regulation, because as you said, several reservations are dry. Do you find it to be a challenge, the prevalence of off presence, uh, adjacent uh, off presence, like off uh, premise licensing? So places that are adjacent to reservations. I know we had a yeah, yeah, that we won't go down that path right now. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I would love to come back. I would love to answer more questions. Absolutely, yes. I'll just leave it at that. The last thing I would really love to say is I wanted to connect the dots with the ballot measure 108 and understand the various parts of this conversation and what we're looking at. Ballot measure 108 increases the tobacco taxes. Caroline shared many of the successes that we are seeing in Indian country with that funding that's coming directly to tribes. That increased tobacco tax, this money is going directly to tribal governments to use to slow down and stop the use of commercial tobacco in our communities, which again are off the charts rates because of all the reasons we've been talking about today. And so I just really want to um, reiterate that point that I know this is a hard decision. I know it hasn't happened in a long time. We believe that if um, here in my taxes increase and money can be put forth to prevention, the tribes would use it in a good way. Thank you. I, I do want to know, because again, probably a question on other people's minds that, that maybe they're not asking, uh, casinos and alcohol. Again, another topic. <laughs> I'm here to improve health. Yes. I am not economic development. Um, I'll tell you, when we had a casino in Burns for a very short time, Old Camp Casino, no longer there. So please stop the stereotypes about all tribes are getting rich off casino. It's Burns site is not. Um, it was really hard working in prevention and having the tribes choose to sell alcohol in their casino. That was a very difficult, hard, hard decision. That sitting through tribal leadership, tribal council meetings, talk about economic development for the tribe, which I get, and the suffering of our people when it comes to alcoholism. So, right. So, I, I, I it's I, a very I, legit, real thing. Right. But I wanted you to, I wanted you to, to, to address that issue only because I think as the state of Oregon, we sort of sit in the same place. Yeah, mm -hmm. exactly. Yeah. That's what I understand. Well, again, um, I meant to get you out of here by three o'clock, but oh well, here we are. Um, thank you so much, uh, Caroline and, and and Julie. Just I really truly appreciate, it. and I hope that I hope that people do reach out and ask questions, and that we can have further conversation uh, about this issue. Yeah, and, and it's that as well. Thank you so much. Um, we are adjourned. Thank you. Thank you.